Hi there, welcome along to the JersNet podcast, the independent Rangers show made by fans for fans, where all of our content is absolutely free. And guys, what a piece of free content we've got for you this evening. Obviously, you're joining us live on Tuesday, the 24th of May. It's 50 years to the day, uh, the anniversary of the 1972 Cup Winners' Cup final uh, between Rangers and Moscow Dynamo in, uh, in the new camp in Barcelona. Um, so you're joining us for a really, really special show tonight where we won't just look back at, at last week's Europa League heartache, but we're also going to try and revel in, in Saturday's long-awaited and glorious Scottish Cup final victory. But before we get into all of that really good stuff, uh, we're going to try and make ourselves feel slightly better about last week's events in Seville by celebrating the, the release of uh, the, the, the much-anticipated, hotly-anticipated Rangers 72, the film that documents our greatest ever moment uh, over in Spain and has already created quite the buzz on uh, on the Rangers social media world. As I say, my name's Ross Bennett. I'm going to be your host tonight. I'm delighted, first and foremost, to be joined, as always, by Alex Anderson. Alex, you and I have had quite the season together looking at European trips and matches and highs and lows. Um, are you starting to process the events of last week? Just about, yeah. I think, I think basically today. Uh, today, I think um, Saturday definitely helped uh, Ross to, to end uh, on, a, on a high, a much, a much deserved high. But yeah, I was in the, the depths of despair last Wednesday. Um, but uh, I was feeling a bit rough today. You know, the throat was kind of going. I was worried I wasn't going to make it. And I said to my wife, it's probably, I'm probably getting late onset hay fever. And she kind of said, is, 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 that, is that the same uh, late onset hay fever that had you staggered in at midnight? Uh, on Saturday night and <laughs> slurring your words, yeah, that'll be it. That'll, yeah, that'll yeah, be yeah. It. but it was so, a it was a really really high pollen count in South Glasgow yes. on Saturday. So and it's and it's been a draining season, you That's know. What so it has been taking its toll, mate. It really really has been. Look, Alec, um, it's been a real pleasure sort of blethering to you over the past. 10 months or so of this season but I'm going to ask you to sort of stay quiet but handsome over the next maybe 20 to 25 minutes if that's okay because I'm, I'm really really delighted to be able to bring in Giuseppe De Luca. Giuseppe is the, the head of studio at The City Talking and director uh, as I mentioned of that newly released film Rangers 72 which exactly half a century on from our, our first European trophy win is, is kind of looking back exploring celebrating that story behind the Barcelona Bears and their famous Cup Winners Cup triumph. Giuseppe thank you so much for joining us this evening how are you? Thank you. Yeah, I'm great. I'm great. I was just explaining that this is the fun bit now, you know, making the films the hard bit, talking about it and uh, and enjoying all that. That's the fun bit. So, yeah, thank you for having me. No, our, our pleasure. It's a, it's a real delight. Um, obviously, today's a, a very, very, very special day um, in, in Rangers history. It's this season's big for us. It's our 150th anniversary, uh, meaning that when Rangers lifted the Cup Winners' Cup in, in Barcelona in 1972, that was 100 years from the formation of the club. Um, everything tied together very nice. It would have tied together even more nicely if we'd won in Seville last week, but we will have to make do with one victory in Spain. Um, Giuseppe, we're going to talk, if, if we may, about Barcelona, about 1972, and about, of course, Rangers 72, the, the, the new film that you and your studio have, have produced. Um, it's certainly for for the city talking. It's it's far from your first foray into you know football filmmaking um, or, or or sports filmmaking. And um, but looking through your website, most of what you've done so far seems to have been geared towards Leeds United and and rugby league in, in Leeds as well. Um, could you maybe sort of outline how it is that uh, the, the city talking studios kind of works and the previous productions that you've been involved in and and how this has all come to pass? Absolutely. So yeah, we, we're probably most known for our our sports um, documentaries. You know, we, we've done um, documentaries on music and on comics and lots of other things, but yeah, probably most known for our sport. And the first foray into sports documentaries for us was with a film called Do You Want to Win, um, which is on Amazon Prime. And that was following the Howard Wilkinson, Leeds United era, um, the kind of last champions, if you will, the last guys to to win the the old Division One before it became the Premier League. Um uh, you know, the real class of 92 some would say a lot of our projects have got a bit of a, a kick against element to them um, we spent a bit of time after that with rugby league as you mentioned before so we did um, we did a film called As Good As It Gets which was about the, the treble winning season for Leeds Rhinos um, but also allowed us to sort of look into rugby league as a sport and what it does for the towns that, that it, you know it represents then after that, we we did a series called We Play League, which was for Sky Sports. Um, and that was a, a fly on the wall following uh, all the rugby league teams for a season. But again, allowed us to look into the, the history of rugby league, how it was formed, the um, the circumstances and, and kind of cultural context of that. And then probably what we're most known for recently is, um, as you mentioned earlier, the Leeds United take us home two seasons of that, which was 
yeah, just a, a fly on the wall, following that team, following Marcelo Bielsa, um, coming to Leeds United and trying to take them uh, back into the Premier League after 16 years. Uh, again, an Amazon Prime production. And then we we filmed with Hertha Berlin in Berlin. Fantastic team, fantastic city, obviously. And obviously, most recently, Rangers 72, our, our most recent you know, flagship football documentary. And and what was it then that that drew you north? That drew you up to Glasgow to look at the the seventy two project. Um, <clears throat> I mean, the story, the story. You know, story wins every time. I I, uh, I love the idea of dragging us up north when you say that because like it's. The f- I think the first interview that I did with was uh, Alex and Ronnie, and you guys were talking about that, and it's the first time I've ever felt like a southerner in any situation. Um, you know. A big part of my identity is is being northern. Like I'm, you know, born and raised north of England. My dad's Sicilian, so south of Italy, very similar um, ideals, should we say? And so to find ourselves, yeah, the southerners in that situation was quite was quite strange. But a lot of our projects have kind of got um, what I would call like northern sensibilities to them. Like we love an underdog. We love we love to kick against and. Um, so yeah, the further north, the further north, the better. Ultimately, but no, the story for this, you know, listen, I, I've um, I've always said that I feel like this is the the most incredible and ridiculous footballing stories that I've certainly ever come across, and um, it's just you know it's just got everything that you that you'd want um, as a filmmaker. You know, it's it's got it's got the chaos, it's got it's got drama, uh, it's got tragedy, it's got redemption. Um, so, you know, it's just all there for the taking. And then also, you know, Rangers Football Club, for us, um, having worked in, in sport and football for the last few years, um, you know, it's, it's one of a handful of clubs in the world, really, that's got that kind of stature, that kind of history. The reverence for its history is a huge, a huge thing for me, a huge draw. And um, yeah, it's just all there. I mean, just finally, just vi- visually, like... Um, at the stadium, when you turn up to the stadium, it's beautiful. The 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 marble stairway, the the manager's office, the trophy room. You know, it's a gift visually, and and it lends itself to film uh, so much. And you know, as does the city of Glasgow. And um, yeah, I could go on for hours. Let's not. But um, yeah, it, it was just a, a real a real. We have to do this. And I think I think for us as fans, it's a real pleasure to see all of those different elements, not just representing the city that that we love and the club that we love, but the the story of of leading up to that match. Because you you know you mentioned the history of the club, um, the, the the drama. I always think the context of us winning that that tournament one year on from the very very famous Ibrox disaster in which sixty six fans sadly lost their lives. All of that context kind of bubbles together um, in in the background of that story. Um, Recently, the, the 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 film Ranger Seventy Two had you had your premiere of the movie in Glasgow, um, but even if anyone's not seen it yet, just with all of the, the the trailers and and the the clips that are floating around, it's clear that the film goes much beyond simply sort of recounting the score and who scored the goals. It it it, it certainly goes much further into all of those elements that you mentioned. As director of the film, I guess, what was your your overarching vision for for the film? What did you want to achieve with this film? Um. You know, I think it's I think it's slightly linked to to our journey as a studio, really. Like the the last couple of years, last few years, we've been sort of on a on a mission. I mean, I certainly personally have, and I know uh, Lee, who founded the company, and um, Stacy and Shanting. We we we've been on a like, on a mission, really, to sort of capture the beauty. And uh, I always talk about the transcendent nature of football, and uh, everyone has a go at me for 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 always going on about that. But, but you know, why is football important? What can it do for people? What can it do for cities? Um, and trying to get to the nub of that. And, and I feel like we sort of felt like we'd done it a bit with Leeds. I, I think it's, um, you know, it's always weird to talk about your own work, but I think it's safe to say that it's it, that stands out in, in the tone of it. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful look at football. So, you know, I, thought we, I think we felt like we'd done that. We'd sort of put it to bed and then you see a story like this. And um, and it just it's got all of the elements to be able to answer a lot of those questions that we posed ourselves. So 
So the overarching vision was to essentially take this story and use it as the ultimate, here's the ultimate example of what football can do. Here's the ultimate example of how football can, can, can change a city, can, can give hope, can uh, transform a club, can, can transform people. Um, it just felt like the, yeah, the ultimate example of how you could do that. Um, then, you know, just really quickly on the players as well, because you can have an overarching vision and, and, and I certainly you have to define that at the beginning, but you should also be really open to that changing. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I was really, you know, obviously blessed to, to be able to speak to all these guys. And one of the things that came out of it was the way that they were looking back on their lives and looking back on what they'd achieved. And that, and that really brought another element to the film, really. It was like, of course, football is the driver here, but like, you know, what, what is success? How do you want to be remembered? What's your legacy? Uh, what are those moments in life that come, al- come along and do you, do you take them? Do you capture them? You know? Um, so yeah, that, that was loosely it, I think. It's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned the players there because uh, this is, we're talking about 90 minutes of football 50 years ago. And yet those players have, in, in my opinion, left a legacy throughout the, the city and the country. Um, I'm I'm 30 years old, so this game took place 20 years before I was born, and yet most passionate Rangers fans of my generation can name you that starting eleven. And and you and your crew had the the, the privilege, I suppose, of interviewing members of that team who who won the trophy that night. What was the the sense that you got from them about that legacy? Do you feel that did the players feel that their achievement was kind of sufficiently respected that the legacy was was strong enough for what they achieved? Um. Yeah, interesting one. I mean, I feel like I feel like the players are discovering their legacy and how heroic they are, to use that word, at the same pace like as, as the club and potentially as the fans. I think that, you know, we are today the fiftieth fiftieth anniversary. Um, with every anniversary, this is changing, right? This is becoming more important, more um, more special. You know, it's becoming people are seeing like actually how instrumental this this was to the club and and to the identity and to the fans. So um, yeah, I'd say that first and foremost, you know, these guys are these these guys are ex footballers. You know, they're not after dinner speakers. They're not all these things. They're just they're ex footballers, but there's a special thing that because they're at a certain point in their lives now, as I said before, you know, where they're sort of looking back at their, their legacy. And I think they're just as amazed as, as everyone else about this story in a way. Um, you know, but you've also got people like John Gregg, who I think is very aware of, of what his role is in securing that legacy. Very strange for me to, to interview a man who's got a statue of himself, you know, outside of the, the club, you know, that, that, that's a rarity. Um, yeah. So, so I think that, that some of the, you know, some of the players, well, it, it wouldn't be the same if, for example, on Wednesday, um, you know, Rangers managed to do that and lift, and lift that cup. If you went to speak to those players straight after, you know, it'd all be viscerally there and, and all that sort of thing. And there's a, there's something great about that, but on the other the other side of it, the fact that it's 50 years later, they're really starting to sort of eulogise over it. And um, yeah, just really quickly to round this one off, there's there's um, Bill Matheson is a great example of what I'm trying to sort of say. Um, when I turned up to Bill Matheson's house and wasn't really sure what to expect, you sort of pigeonhole people a bit into you know the Joker and the 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 whatever. And I'd heard he was maybe a bit quiet or something. I think is what I remember. Anyway. Um, Bill was in the middle of writing his memoirs um, and writing poetry about what had happened. Um, I'm sure he won't mind me saying he got quite emotional during it. And so I think that the the legacy of these guys is really only starting to hit home in this. And I think, and I, and I, and I think, as I said, for everyone, probably, as we get to the 50th year, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think that this film, you, you've mentioned players like John Gregg there who their, their legend status, if, if that's not too cliched, is, is embedded within the club. He's, he's um, 
a permanent fixture at the club, not just in terms of his statue, but in terms of his reserved seat in the director's box on match day. But it does give us the opportunity perhaps to delve a little bit deeper into characters like Willie Matheson, um, Peter McCloy, Dave Smith, who we may not necessarily in, in the younger generations have, have seen so much of or, or heard so much about. Um, and, and part of the reason for that, I suppose, is the lack of... Um, of footage, you know, Rangers have just played 19 matches in in this season's Europa League campaign or, or European competition with uh, the, the two games in the Champions League as well, all of which were broadcast live on telly. Everyone's filming. It's on Twitter. I go on YouTube five minutes after full time and I can get the highlights. But in, in 1972, even the final itself um, wasn't shown live. People were having to stay up late to watch a delayed transmission. There was a real lack of media coverage at the time compared to what we have today with rolling news and social media. Did that lack of footage and archive material affect the ability for you and your crew to be able to properly retell the story? Um, yeah, um, it sort of, it didn't, it didn't. Um, I know exactly what you mean. And on Wednesday, you know, I sort of had PTSD. I was like, are we, you know, are we recording this? Like someone needs to be recording this. Whereas the reality is, as you rightly say, everything about that run will be on the internet forever. Every interview, every, every, um, and so you're absolutely right that, that there isn't, there wasn't that for this. And, and it, it gives you a challenge, but also can make things more special as well. So absolutely it was a challenge trying to track down a lot of this stuff. And I mean, some of it just doesn't exist, you know, like um, Lisbon, one of the most important grounds to the story in terms of the cha chaotic nature of everything. Um, and they're just, you know, it's just not there. It doesn't exist. So um, we had to be, we had to be creative um, about how we tell that story. But also, as I said, I do think it added a real special element. You've got kind of what two parts to it. You've got, number one, there are things in there that you potentially wouldn't have found or even looked for if everything was al already there on the surface. Um, and two examples of those would be um, the Willy Waddle notes that we've got that are in the film, which were just, you know, I, I got real goosebumps when we saw them for the first time. That is someone that you've been, you know, reading so much about, learning so much about. And I'm obsessed with Willie Waddle as a man, you know, like, I, uh, you know, I just became obsessed. So to see his notes was amazing. We've got, um, you know, on the back of the Munich Hotel uh, paper, you know, he's just written out the team, the team squad, the, the, yeah, the team structure, which is in the film. And then on the back of the Wren, um, a cafe in Wren. He's just got like all the, the names and the tactics. And so it's things like that, that, you know, that, that make it really special. Then you've got, of course, um, we've got Jake Muir, uh, who's a fan who made the trip to Barcelona, bless him, kept his eight millimetre super eight uh, real, you know, we had it digitized and, you know, it's stuff like that, that I just think, if if everything was there and available, you would you probably wouldn't have you know you probably wouldn't have things like that. Um, but absolutely, it was a chore trying to find it and trying to uh, trying to tell certain parts of the story. But um, yeah, I think I think we've I think I hope we've done it justice. That's a really sort of fascinating insight into the process of of uncovering that material that mm. um, certainly wouldn't necessarily uh, have to happen in, in, in if we're looking at an event. Um, such as uh, had Rangers gone on to, to win the Europa League last week. And I guess a question for yourself, Giuseppe, is as that match was ticking on, as Joe Arribo gets the goal, um, are you starting to think, hang on, we've got some excellent publicity here for, for Rangers 72? Or are you thinking actually no one will be interested because it's all about 2022 now? Or were you maybe even having one eye on a, on a little sequel in a few years' time? I mean, there's been plenty of jokes about the sequel um, in my WhatsApp. So the Bar the Barca Bears have got a WhatsApp group, um, so that they, they were they were bouncing around ideas of sequels, and then a few other guys that were in the films. Tom Miller, you know, uh, probably had a couple of um, couple of sangrias and sent. A, you know, we're on. This is the this is the sequel. Um, we were. I think I mentioned earlier. Maybe it was before we came online. I was as nervous, I think, as any as any fan. It's incredible how invested you can become when you when you go searching for the heart of a club. You know, like it. it it's just, um, yeah. We 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 were dying for for Rangers to do it. I mean, it would have been obviously it would have been amazing for the film, but 
just the it would have just been freaky as well, you know, like on the fifth day, just the whole thing. Um, and then, you know, we spent time with um, Kamar Roof. You know, we spent a year with Kamar while he was at Leeds United. So, that, you know, even without this, there's like a, 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 we probably would have been watching rooting for Kamar. Um, so, no, it was, yeah, we, we were dying for dying for it to happen. And, um, you know, I must admit, on I think it was the Monday afternoon, I'm starting to see all the WhatsApps coming through and it's real, you know, like everyone's there and I'm, and I'm starting to look at the drive time to Seville, you know, how can we do this thing, you know? So, um, so no, it was that we only wanted one result that night for sure. I think we all did, and we came so close, so close. Um, but look, more seriously, I guess on on that point, what is your hope for the film in terms of a reception with with a younger fan base? I mean, as as we sort of have this conversation, um, I don't think any of us on this call uh, are, are old enough to either have experienced that game or remember anything off it. Um, certainly, even Rangers supporters in their early fifties don't necessarily remember the game or the day itself. Uh, the, do you hope, especially after the events of, of last week, that this film gives us another way to celebrate our club lifting European trophy when we were unable to do so um, a second time around? Absolutely. I mean, you know, as I said earlier, you guys have got one of the most incredible uh, stories in, in in football history and I think that the fact that it happened in the 70s as well it's like you know it's almost like the previous dynasty and um, uh, absolutely and and the sh- for the young fans um, you know this is this is showing them this is much more than just a, a song that's sung on the terraces you know this is this is I remember when I was writing the sort of um, the sort of pitch document in a way like the kind of uh, the, the initial briefing I started it off with a sentence that was um, something along the lines of to know where you're going you've got to know where you've been this is the forgotten story of football at its most potent most relevant most beautiful I forget the actual line and, and the, the idea for that at the time was a much more overarching thing of like um, uh, you know to, for us to know where we're going in modern football, we've got to know about the most beautiful, the most uh, incredible stories from its history. And as time, as 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 the guys were going through the various rounds in this most recent cup run, that then started to be much more about um, the Rangers fans now and the, and the club now. To know where you're going, you've got to know where you've been. You know, you've got to you've got to understand what it takes to lift a trophy like that, um, what goes into it, you know, what, what these guys did, what the context at the time was. Um, so absolutely there's something in it for the, for the young Rangers fans. And I think that they will be very proud that, that, that there's a story there that they absolutely, like you say, will know the names of the legends and everything, but will they know what these guys look like in their homes as, you know, 70 odd year olds going to the pub, like we did with, with Willie Johnson and, um, you know, and then, for young football fans, you know, I, that th- this is absolutely a, a film for Rangers fans. But this is a film for a global audience. That's what I set out to do. And that's what we always set out to do. Um, and for young football fans, you know, this is, this is about, you know, football is a gift. I always say it's the greatest theatre. Um, it, it, it teaches you about your identity. It's about you know friendships and and you know for men and men, the mental health kind of aspect and community and all these sorts of things so you've got to make sure that you know you protect those things and the, and the way you protect it is you understand its core and and its values and you make sure that you know as football changes you know the ongoing capitalization of, of everything as, as football changes you've got to make sure that what that we don't lose what makes it special and how we do that is telling stories like this, you know, telling stories that are special and um, that, that do talk to that core and the sensibility of, of what it is. And, um, and for younger fans to understand that and to, to, tr- to try to in the noise of it all, not lose that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, I think it's crucially important. I, um, uh, you sort of referenced there the the, the growing commodification and, and capitalization of football. That to me screams a growing gulf between Scottish football and and the big five, the big six leagues in in Europe. And 
that maybe our diminishing chances of of repeating Barcelona in 1972. Um, I, I, my fears of that are are diminished somewhat after last week, of course. But I think that it is important, therefore, to tell that story to make sure that the next generation of Rangers fans and football fans um, understand that story. Because there's a, I, I feel that there's a real. Um, issue with with people looking down on clubs like Rangers because of the the national context in which we play, um, but to actually tell the story of how this happened and 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 what we were able to achieve, um, I think it's it's crucially important. So I guess that actually the most important question I can ask you tonight is, how do we get our hands on it? Where can people you know grab a copy of the film? Um, but of course, it's not just it's not just the the, the film itself. There's um, the, there's the book. There's the artwork. So where can where can people get hold of it? Yeah, I mean, I would have loved to have um, come on here and talked about our, our digital release, which we've said, you know, it is going to happen. But unfortunately, our lips are sealed on that one. We, you know, we will have a date and, and a digital partner soon. Um, but as you rightly said, the, the, the DVD and the, and the products, you know, what the idea was that you've got a first wave. You know, if you, if you want to see this thing first, you know, the only way to do it is through a physical a physical copy, which I think is really important. And, and in that, we've created a whole world of products. And, you know, I'm in a privileged position that I just have to concentrate on the film. So when I saw the book, which we've got, you know, I was like a fan seeing that. I couldn't believe it. It's really, really a great piece. So, yeah, we've got um, the DVDs, the Blu-rays. Um, we've got a book. We've got some fantastic artwork. So Peter O'Toole, who who did the illustrations of the players that I'm sure you've seen as the, the film poster has done different posters, uh, which are incredible. And then um, the other thing we've done is the frame, the collector's frame, which, you know, I think came from a place of before we've sort of regretted a bit with other projects, not, um, not creating these physical tangible things because these are a mass, you know, this, these projects are a big part of our lives. You know, you give up a lot of, of your, your time and your energy and all that sort of thing and stays with you forever. And so you want, you want to have those little memories and mementos. And I feel like um, in the streaming age, we've said to ourselves, you know, it's up there. <laughs> we don't like, we can't, you know, we can't see it. We can't think. And uh, Lee, who, who founded the company, who's the exec producer on this for his birthday, I got him um, a frame of of some something to do with Take Us Home. I won't go into what it was, and and it was a really like nice piece. That he liked. It. I really I really enjoyed uh, you know coming up with that, and it was that. And we were like, we've got to you know have something similar that you can that that is is defines the world of this project. And the one thing we kept coming back to was the pennant. You know, obsessing over the pennant in the trophy room, it's incredible. And so we we've redesigned, we you know, we've re remade the pennant. Um, you've got Peter O'Toole's illustration on there. There's a you get a unique message, and the players have signed the pennant. Um, so there's 500 of those. I think they're super rare. Not even I'm allowed one. So um, they are yeah. And then the book, you know, it's the story of the of of the story, but it's also of how we made the film and some of the choices that we made. And as I say, like I, I was able to kind of see that as a, as a fan in a way. And, um, uh, Shanting who's our creative director and Lee really ran away with that book and it's a beautiful, beautiful piece that, that certainly I'll keep. So yeah, there's, there's plenty on there. Go to rangers 72.com and you can, you can get first look at the film and you can, um, you know, have a look at these products and then keep your eye on socials because we will be announcing the the digital way to watch this film. Fantastic. That sounds that sounds great. Listen, I think it's um it's a really marvelous thing that that, that you and your your studio have done to to bring this story to life again um at, at such a um such an important time in Rangers history, as I say, 150th anniversary of the club, everything that we've been through in the last 10 years leading up to the European final of last week, everything seems to have come together quite nicely in terms of the context there. So um, a real thank you, Giuseppe, to, to you for giving us your time this evening, but more importantly to you and your colleagues for, for making this film and, and giving the story of our first European trophy win, one of only three sides ever to, to lift 
um, European silverware, the, the the reverence and and the the context that it deserves. So a massive thank you to you. I, I echo that. I encourage everyone to go to ranger72.com, have a look at the trailer, and uh, I don't think anyone's going to be able to resist purchasing a copy of the film. Thank you, Ross. And um, yeah, I mean, I hope, you know, I hope we've done what is an, a, a very important story uh, to you guys. I hope we've done it justice. That's always our, our, our first aim. Um, so I really hope people enjoy it. I really hope you think we've done it justice. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for, for allowing us on. You know, it's great to be able to talk about it, actually, finally. No, that's our pleasure. It's uh, a real joy to have you here. But I will I will let you go because it's getting late cool. and you do not need to hear myself and Alec heartbreak over last week. Um, I don't think anyone needs to hear that, but we will okay. go into it. Thanks well, very much. Thanks. Jeff. Really appreciate that, sir. You know, great, thank you, great to talk to you again. Um, thank yeah, you. Great, guys. And uh, I wish you all the luck in the future. Top man. Thank you very Take much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Right, Alec, we can't put it off any longer. Um, from one European final to another, uh, we're only you know less than a week on from, from the events of last Wednesday. And of course, a, a huge amount has happened since then. Um, a week or a, a three-day, four-day span of extreme lows and extreme highs. Um, let's start with the lows and we'll end, we'll end on a high. We'll, we'll take a look at, at the trip to Seville. Before we get into the game itself, um, I think it's right that we, we look at the treatment of our fans. There was a, a, a statement that came out from Rangers today essentially expressing their disappointment and unhappiness with how our fans were treated in that stadium in Seville um, and encouraging fans to kind of speak up through the, the FSE and, and contacting the SLO. Um, ultimately, whether it was the lack of, of water, a lack of catering facilities and refreshments, fans being subjected to, um, I, I, I guess, unnecessary levels of searching with, with personal items that had been previously approved being taken off them, um, these things, I think, definitely impacted on the mood and therefore the atmosphere that the Rangers fans were able to, to create probably swung that into, into Eintracht Frankfurt's favour and, of course, could have helped to, to decide a very, very close match. Um, what are your thoughts on, uh, I guess, the logistics of, of Rangers fans in that stadium last week? Yeah, um, first thing I've got to say, Ross, uh, well, first thing I've got to do is apologise. Um, I, did, I did this on my Twitter uh, page when the, uh, the, the stories first started emerging. I was in absolute state last Wednesday. You know, I don't mean drink-wise, that's probably the problem. I was, I was completely sober, but uh, nerves-wise and what have you, while watching the game, I, I felt absolutely... It was too much for me, I think, almost. I wanted it so badly. It was too much. And I was also kind of a bit emotionally confused and down on myself because I wasn't there, you know, just through sheer stupidity of not... You know, organising a passport, and probably because I, I realised I don't actually. I'm getting to that age. I haven't been to so many European away games as, as I used to. That I don't really deserve to be there, to be honest. So um, there was a lot of that going on with me, and I, I think a, a few of us did this. A few of us were, were guilty of this, just thinking, "Where's the noise coming from our fans? Where, where, why are we not making?" You know, and, and and it started. It fed into this kind of bitterness that was lurking at the back of my mind. There was like, oh, the wrong people are getting the tickets and what have you. You know, we, we had. We clearly had maybe at least I would say three fifths of the stadium uh, was was Rangers fans. Um, I think that it looked like the rest of it was Eintracht fans. So well, well done to both sets of supporters for for you know getting the corporate buggers out of there and really you know the, 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 you know, the, the kind of hangers on the people with no real interest in the game um, and, and and taking over be real fans. But yeah, when I found out what had actually been going on, I was I was deeply ashamed of myself. Uh, um, Ross, it was it was terrible. I've 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 had that. I've, I've been to Spain a couple of times following Rangers. One time in Villarreal, the first time we played them almost twenty years ago in the, in the, in the Champions League, and I, the, the locals were absolutely fantastic, you know. But the Guarda Seville are a, a different mob altogether, um, and I think Andalusia is also kind of you know um, a bit more to the right, perhaps of politics generally, a bit more pro Spain, you know, pro centralist, if you like. Um, generally, you know, Spain, the Spanish national team used to go to that very stadium, uh, the Ramon Sanchez Pizzo one, when they needed a result, when they needed a, a particularly febrile crowd um, behind them. And it just seems like our fans were basically dehydrated to the max, um, were <laughs> treated completely differently to the Eintracht fans. And that's that's when you start going down the road of the, the politics, Gibraltar, um, uh, you know, the, the Guarda Seville. Uh, uh, I think still kind of represent or still kind of coloured by um, their affiliation with Franco, basically, um, and, and, and the kind of fascist days. That sounds like it's taking it too far, but the things I've experienced myself from them, 
um, run completely counter to normal Spanish life. To you know, your, your actual the fans you meet over there, but uh, yeah, it seems like they saw that the negative track fans were allowed their pyros in, they were allowed their uh, tifos, they all had their flags on them. Rangers fans were getting insulin, diabetic Rangers fans were getting insulin taken off them. They were getting the phone chargers taken off them. And and worst of all, they were not, after being made to walk miles, miles into the, from the city uh, centre to the, the stadium and kept outside kind of kettles, they were then not allowed to have any water. And were actually having bottles of water confiscated from them on their way in. Now, nobody knows, like the people of southern Spain, how much water's required in that kind of temperature. Those kind of temperatures, so it, it just it seemed to be bordering on the wanton, and uh, quite frankly, I'm proud as hell um, of any Rangers supporter who managed to create the noise that they actually did yeah. last week in those conditions. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that sums up really, really nicely. It's um, really sort of heartbreaking and tragic to hear the way that, that we were treated compared to to Frankfurt, and you do have to question why. Um, uh, UEFA do not accept direct complaints. I noticed that that was that was part of the Rangers statement today. So I don't think that's, that's by accident. That's, that's handy, isn't it? That's mm-hmm. good, isn't it? There we go. Look, let's um, let's get into the game itself. And for all of the build up, for all of the excitement, you and I spoke the day before the game um, on on this very podcast. Um, ultimately, we've come away with with the result that we were not looking for, um, and it, it all came down to. The way that I see it is one one kick of the ball. That's not necessarily the penalty kick. It could have been Connor Goldson kicking the ball away. It could have been Ryan Kent kicking the ball in the back of the net. Any one of three kicks of that ball could have won us that game. Um, so for for you in your mind, where did it where did it go wrong? How critical should we be at this point of of the manager and players for for not getting that result over the line? Uh, I, th- I think I, again, my opinion will vastly change from the kind of uh, like a scorched earth emotion I was in last week. It was, it was neither in tears nor throwing stuff about the house. I was just I was just sitting there feeling utterly devastated, just kind of hollowed out. You know, there was just nothing. I think it's one of those results, Ross, one of those moments where you just you've got to kind of absorb it into the soul. You know, it's going to shape your, your future as a Rangers, your character as a Rangers fan. Um it's not something you can cry over or whatever. It's 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 taken it's taken days for me to get to this point when I realised how stupid my reaction was. Uh, last Wednesday, it's just from the sheer the years I've had of just obsessed with European football. Um, and one great thing about this pod, one of the many great things about this pod is it makes me watch the game again. I thought I better watch the game again if I'm going to go and and, and talk about it. Um, and it's not half as bad as I thought it was at the time. We didn't get going, Ross. The Germans did, and I think that the thing that sticks out for me is. Uh, in fact, Frankfurt have played 48 competitive games this season. I did a wee tweet there. Uh, just pointing this out, Rangers, Rangers played their 65th. We were playing their 64th uh, game of the season last uh, last Wednesday night. Eintracht Frankfurt were playing their 48th and last. Um, they we were speaking last Tuesday in the preview pod about how we shouldn't look at the Bundesliga form as, as encouragement for Rangers. We should look at it as why Eintracht will probably have as much energy, if not more, than us. Um, they've, they've been kind of Aberdeening their season, if you like. That, but we were, when we were playing Malmo uh, in the Champions League, they've They've gone out to a third division team in the German Cup. Um, Volta of Mannheim are putting them out of the German Cup. So that's the one game in that, you know, um, the league season, 34 games for a Bundesliga season. It's already short on the Scottish League, se- league season. There's no League Cup as such, all on a ceremonial thing in, in Germany. Um, and they've gone straight because the Bundesliga, you know, is one of the top five leagues, you know, despite their European, their presence in European football being, you know, half, not even half, around right a quarter of Rangers uh, over the years. They walked straight into the group stages by finishing fifth in last year's Bundesliga. So they didn't play any qualifiers or playoffs. Um, and then, fair play to them, they finished top of their group, so that meant they've avoided playing, you know, the, 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 the post-group playoff round, the, the, the last 32 round. So they just looked like a team who, as we feared, they weren't as... They don't look as technically proficient as Dortmund or Leipzig, but they just seem to have a stickiness about them and an extra energy. They started out. They, I, I, I don't. I, I feel as if Rangers, the heat, you know, the fact that we're having water breaks, kind of speaks to how that's going to affect Rangers' kind of high energy game. But you've also got you've also got Eintracht. The, the players out wide. They're, they're playing that four across the middle a bit like Braga did. We failed to take advantage of the three kind of um, centre halves, the, the three defenders when they were pushing up like that. 
Um, he's John Lundstrom was hitting kind of worldy you know, diagonal balls every now and then to Ryan Kent, and kind of we've seen how we could take advantage of it, but they kept Tav, they kept uh, Tav kind of pushed back and contained um, to the point he was giving the ball away um, for for a lot of the game, and we never really got our flow going. But neither did we give up, neither did we stop. We came back at them. They just Frankfurt just seemed to they they've really been concentrating in Europe this season. They've not been fighting against relegation. They've not been trying to get into European places in the league. They've just, all they've had is this European run. Uh, and I think it showed. Uh, when I watched the game again, we had kind of clearer mind. And with the Saturday making things a lot a lot easier to see uh, clearly, it was it's pretty obvious that Rangers kept coming back at them. But they just started everything. They started the game quicker. They started a post-water break. They started it quicker, you know. And even after we scored our goal, um, they went straight back up the park and they're having shots on our goals straight away. They just... They, just, they had resilience and they had tactical acuity, but I think more than anything else, Ross, they just had the better fitness. They had more in their legs than us. That's exactly how I saw it as well, because uh, they just, on the day, they just had a little bit more. I don't think they're better than us. No. Um, I don't think they're better than us in, in any way at all. I just think that they had that that little bit more than us on the day. And um, and actually, I, I see it very, very similar to you. That doesn't that doesn't bring me sort of feelings of of anger or frustration at our team um it, it, and and actually it probably differentiates a little bit from 2008 where i think there was a bit more of a feeling of frustration about about how we set up and things like that but um yeah with with all of the the the, the disappointment and the heartbreak of, of last wednesday my overwhelming feeling coming away from it is that frankfurt just had a little bit more and that was from as we say, the, the the players on the pitch haven't played almost half the number of games that Rangers did over the season um, through to their their fans in the stands who were literally provided with more by UEFA and by the authorities in that stadium. So this, this, was, the th- this was the third game in Spain as well, Ross, yeah. in this campaign. You know, they, they won in the new camp, you know, and you can never take that off. Amazing. Yeah. But they've also they've played in Seville itself. You know, they, they beat, beat Betis. Betis yeah. You know, and uh, they're a team that's set up to play with the... the won all but one of their away games in Europe yeah. this season. Um, and I think we've got a team who's, you know, apart from the game in Dortmund, which is utterly sensational, we've been a home team. Uh, Ibox yeah. has, has, has been Definitely. massive for us, you know. But uh, yeah, it just it, it it wasn't to be, but having watched it back, you could see they just chopping and changing, doing everything they possibly could. Yeah. Gio's throwing everything at it. The players were throwing everything at it. We just didn't have that, just that little edge, that little bit of sharpness uh, on the night. But look, despite all of that, we we make it to half time. We get through the first... Um... 10 minutes of the of the second half and, that, and on the 57th minute Joe Aribo pops up through on goal um, mistake from the, the Frankfurt defender admittedly um, but very very cool composed finish from Joe Aribo to become only the fourth player in our club's history to score in a European final um, and I, I very very sort of vividly and clearly remember sitting in this chair watching that moment and going whatever happens try and enjoy this moment now because we are winning a European final. So let's just remember this feeling. Um, and that's a feeling I will I will never, ever forget. Um, at that point, as you say, after a, a difficult start that Rangers managed to batter through and get to halftime and then take the leads, did you believe that we would kind of kick on, find some rhythm and, and bring that trophy home? Yeah, I hoped. I hoped we would, uh, Ross. But I, I've got to be honest, I, as I say, I was in a Dwarm, so I can't really... Having watched it back as well, I can, I can see why I was thinking. I, 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 I actually akin to the feeling I had about Stephen Gerrard's Rangers when they used to go to Rugby Park. Sometimes we, we would just start badly, and it was we could never. And even when we took the lead, we didn't know we took the lead badly. We didn't know how to process that and kind of go on and and use that. The, the momentum was gone, um, and I think last that, that the feeling I had was we've got a foothold in the game. I, I, I felt then it was probably you know we're not going to lose it in the ninety minutes probably. Um, I was utterly delighted and I've started but I think a lot of it's trying to protect your own emotions um, I had that kind of it was a cold shiver down the spine I couldn't actually cope with the prospect we could be on our way to win a European trophy year you could be getting everything you've ever wanted you know and uh, I just quickly shut that down um, and it's just unfortunate that um, the, I mean hang track came straight back at us fair play to them yeah you know yeah but, uh, it, was just, it was just unfortunate it was 12 minutes that that feeling lasted um, and, and Eintracht Frankfurt get their, their equaliser through Bore. Um, clearly been a, a, a sensational player for them this season throughout the Europa League uh, in that campaign. But for me, 
it felt more like a gift from from Rangers. I felt that uh, we could have done more to stop the ball coming in. But really, I mentioned a few minutes ago that I didn't walk away from that game with with feelings of sort of anger or frustration towards the Rangers team. This moment is the one caveat to that because I am I, I still, if I look back at that goal. Connor Goldson has to put his foot through it and put it out for a corner. In my opinion, it felt like a Rangers gift, and and I, I think that when you when you lose a game of that magnitude, and and particularly when you are never expected to be in that position in the first place, we have no right, as I said before, to be in that final. Um, but we earned the right, and we 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 deserve to be there over the course of the season. Um, but when you're the underdogs to even get to that stage, you tend to walk away from those games going, well, everyone did their best and I'm really proud of the team and, and uh, we just had a wonderful run. Um, I, in my opinion, I think Conor Goldson does need to field some criticism for how he failed to deal with that ball across. Um, how did you how did you see that goal coming in? Yeah, I mean, you can look at, I think it's, it sums up um, the general assessment of the whole night. You know, it, it, it looks, if anybody's culpable, it's going to be, Goldson's going to take most of the blame. You can say that maybe uh, Bassey, uh, Calvin Bassey has let uh, Bory get kind of ball side of him, if you like, but that shouldn't be a problem because uh, Connor should be booting into the stand. And maybe Scott Wright, you know, the ball's going through his legs. But I mean, Scott Wright, you know, he's he's the reason we scored. We took the lead. You know, he's a big a big part of that. The way he shut down uh, the defender, then he shuts down trap, and it, it, it turns it into a poor kick. Um, the frustration of not being able to to go at their three at the back. They were missing um, oh, Hinteregger, I think the Austrian, uh, who's the kind of mainstay of their, of their defense. He was missing. He was a big miss for them, but. The thing we keep forgetting, of course, is we didn't have our two strikers. You know, we didn't have, a, you know, we, we got Ruth on for five minutes at the end, but that's another thing that, that, that's got to um, kind of colour your judgment um, of 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 any, or stop your, your criticism going too far with Rangers. Yeah, and Conor Golson was once when we took the leads before before the equalise. You got these little moments where you could see the iconography for the for the decades for the rest of my life. Conor Golson, you know, winning a winning a fifty fifty ball and then going and with three different Eintracht players at the same time and two of them hit the grounds writhing in agony it wasn't a petty game it wasn't there was none of that there's, no, there was, there's not a lot of kind of uh, a lot of hard tackles a lot, a lot of kind of a gusto on that but there was nothing really petty or annoying going on it was quite it's played in quite a, a fair spirit for a European final um, yeah. but to see Conor Golson doing that putting those guys three of them down and clearing the ball you thought here we go this is this is one that's going to be a poster you know <laughs> in, in, in all our walls for the rest of our life and it just it just wasn't there he's put one foot wrong or he, he didn't put that foot anywhere near uh, enough near the ball yeah. and um, but it, I, I can't criticise a guy because he's the reason we were there in the first place yeah no I think that's I think that's absolutely fair um, I think when you, you come away from a, a loss like that do you know what I was thinking about this um, immediately after the game? I was trying to process how I felt because you know, really, I, I said to I called my dad the next day and I said I was there, Hampden twenty sixteen when Hibs did the Scottish Cup and invaded the pitch and all that ugliness. I was in Fir Park in twenty fifteen when we failed to get promoted and all of that ugliness. I was at Easter Road when we lost the Petrofac Cup to to Wraith Rovers. Um, and those were all really, really low, hollow feelings. But losing that Europa final on, on, on penalties was just as hollow and just as low, if not even more so. Um, and you do, I think you do have to try and find ways of rationalising how that happened. And it felt to me, I said to my dad, it feels like I've been dumped. That final whistle went, it felt like I've been dumped out of a long relationship because I found myself going, it can't be over. No, it can't be over. Please say it's not over. Let's go back. What can I do differently? What can we change? I'll make it work. Some, uh, but that's um, uh, it was gone. That, that, that's testament to the team, Ross. That's to the, the medical mate. At the beginning of this this, this run, and we're, we're talking to Giuseppe there about the cut winners cup and the, the, the parallels. So many parallels with that run, especially if you take it from the, the momentum started with with Gio's uh, first group game against Sparta Prague, his first game in charge of Rangers. But really, we end up the the post Christmas thing. You know, has given us the four games against massive opposition. Yeah. You know, really impressive opposition, Portuguese, Germans, whatever, the same as we had through the whole tournament to get to the final in, in 72, the Barcelona Bears. Um, and you think my first stop with most of those games was don't get hammered. Yeah. Just don't get humiliated, Rangers. You know, and by the time we got to the final, I still had a bit of that in me. This could go seriously wrong. You know, in fact, you know, could be underestimated, blah, blah, blah. Um 
and I, I, I fuck that hit me. I think of all the days, 24th of May, 2022, you know, 50 years from um, the new camp and Colin Steen and Willie Johnston and, and everything those, those guys did back then. I think of all the days that they hit me, it's really appropriate that just watching it again tonight, to be, who I mean, I know it's a, it's a simplistic thing to say, but to be so involved, to get it down to penalties, to yeah. for us all to be gutted. I mean, I really went into, I went to all sorts of despair on Friday. Yeah. You know, but it was because we had the taste of it. These guys gave us such a tangible taste of a European trophy. It didn't feel right. I was at Manchester. There was all those games you just listed, except except uh, Fir Park. Thank God for that, that that day. I was at the home leg, but didn't go to the away leg. But um, that's probably why I felt I deserved to be there for some sort of a cleansing uh, <laughs> ceremony. But it was it was just to know that we were actually there at a European final and absolutely devastated we didn't win it. Yeah. I know it's a cliche. That was a cliche I did not want to hear last Wednesday. I didn't want to hear everybody's kind of, oh, but the journey was great. Absolutely. Absolutely. But today, it hit me again, Ross. It's just like, God, I'm so bloody proud. Just so yeah. proud of our team. I'll just say one more thing. We know we're pushed for time, but no, um, no. I think the the big thing, <laughs> I have talked about this, um, how it was a kind of bookend for me. I think a bookend for the club, sorry. No, but me, so bloody self-involved. <laughs> um, a bookend for the club and for the support in general. Um, that day in 2012, March 2012, when Celtic came to town, uh, yeah. came to Ibrox. We just went to administration and things were going things were going south. Yeah. Um, and they were coming to to win the league at Ibrox. I've never felt anything like that before. I've never felt I, I, I parked the car um miles away, I get out of the car, and from the minute, the minute I hit the crowd going down Copeland Road, uh, and it, I felt a, a a passion, a kind of steadfastness that I've never experienced with the Rangers support before. We're very good at winning things. We're not off we're not often good at, you know. Um, kind of making the best of a bad lot, and that's the first time ever, people just drew a line in the sand that day and said, "No, this is this isn't happening." Absolutely. And that was the start. I think. I think that something happened that day. Watch me just going three nothing up that day, and just one of the staunchest performances in our history. It's easy. To, it's easy to win when you're a winning team, but when you're in a bad situation, to pull that out, yeah, was uh, was amazing. And I think it's almost like this was the comp. This was the bookend to get to that European final and to lose it in penalties. And to experience the cruelty of a narrow defeat, when we actually, but that actually signifies no, we're back mm -hmm. and everything's going to be okay, you know, and everything has been getting steadily better. It's actually perfect. We did the win that we needed when we're at our all time low, and we had a, the ability to, to suffer that loss last Wednesday because, you know, we're at an all time high in terms of our support. I think we should all pat ourselves in the back for what we've achieved, uh, everybody around us achieved. Uh, over the last ten years, and uh, I think that that hit me in a big, a big, a big way today, mate. I'm thinking, I'm slagging Ryan Kent for not, you know, keeping that ball down. I'm slagging, you know, Connor Golds for not putting that. In. It's not, it's a bloody European final, yeah. You know, the like of which we, you know, we never thought we'd see. We might not see it again, and that's why it was so frustrating that we didn't get to win it. But um, to actually be contenders and to be frustrated that we didn't win it, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's so proud of them, so proud of everybody. Well, that shows the, I guess, the healing of, of a bit of time passing, doesn't it? Because if I, uh, when I woke up on Thursday morning, if anyone said to me, "You did so well to get there," I'd have battered them. Know. I'd have battered yeah. them. I just yeah. the, the last thing I wanted to hear was, "Oh, but you did really well. You must be so proud." I mean, uh, of course, of course, that's true, and of course, that's rational. But this is not a rational game. This is not yeah. a rational. You team. don't want to hear that straight away. You need no. to absorb it, you know. And I think we're also used to hearing it from across the road. You yeah. know how they, you don't want to be that kind of fan who your defeat means more than somebody else's loss. You want to be sporting about things. Exactly. Um, but I think it, it's it's taken a few days to kick in. It's not sentimental. It's not. We're not trying to alter the result. We're saying in fact, definitely deserve to win on yeah. the night. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, yes. We're just I don't saying. Can argue that. Yeah. What a monumental achievement uh, it, it's been by Rangers. And yeah, Alec of last Wednesday would have punched. Alec of just now for saying this, but what a bloody journey, mate. What yeah. a bloody journey. What a journey. Yeah. What a ride. It's been a, a, a true a true joy, a true pleasure. Um, and a, 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 an absolute joy to get to speak to you, previewing all of those different ties and, and looking at it as a real, a real delight mate. for me. It's been great fun. It has been. Look, let's um let's end this on a high because yeah. only three days after losing that cup final, Rangers had another cup final to um to contest. Uh I could not fathom the job that Gio would have to do to pick those boys up, not just emotionally, but also physically to prepare them um, yeah. for after 120 minutes plus penalties, the emotional heartbreak, the traveling, the heat, the fatigue. Um, 
And what do we do? We just go and produce an epic win after extra time again. Um, my One of my group chats has been renamed the Extra Time Loyal because that's what we seem to be now. Um, a hugely draining match in Europe that goes to extra time in 35 plus degree heat. We take it to extra time at Hamden against Hearts. We, we, we score two goals in six minutes of that, um, the first six minutes of extra time. Um, after 65 games this season, to go and finish the last two games playing two hours as opposed to an hour and a half, um, Rangers are clearly doping and cheating. Um, yes. So in your expert opinion, what drugs are they on? Yes, I, th- I think it's the uh, a heavy dose of uh, the Arno Phillips uh, caffeine. You know, yeah. um, we're selling it Barcelona, you know, 1972, 50 years ago tonight. Uh, Jock Wallace, Murder Hill. You know, he was, he was on the bench, Jock. Yeah, he was a trainer at that point, hadn't yet taken over as manager uh, from Willie Waddle. And he he got them fiercely fit, you know. And by the way, everybody should watch, if you haven't watched it, I think it's, it's on YouTube, you should watch yeah. the ferocity of that Rangers team. Uh, absolutely <laughs> savage, you know. Fantastic, fantastically skillful, but electric to watch uh, the, the, the pace of them. But yeah, mate, it's a. I don't know how you do that mid-season. Mm-hmm. They're already, we're already a seriously fit team, and I think that's why a lot of uh, hot young Scottish prospects, at other clubs, you no, know, Lewis Ferguson, and whatever, never end up at Ibrox because there's, I think there's something there's a, there's a kind of uh, an expected fitness level um, that maybe other players uh, don't don't perhaps come up to. Um, I to do it mid-season, maybe it's as much by resting players, um, not tra- over training them in between games. You know, when you've got so many games. But we've definitely come on. I think a lot of it is in the head, a lot of it is in the, the attitude as well. Um, because the thing I noticed, even even in Seville, even in that heat, even with everything that was happening, going to extra time towards penalties, we finished the game, as we all know, you know so much the stronger. In fact, we're still hitting us in the break really dangerously. But even in that, we kept coming back. It's not like we start fast then fade, as you would expect of an unfit team. Um, and I think that's one of the other things. We'll talk about 2008 and how... It didn't really get going in uh, 2008. There wasn't a lot, a great optimism. There was optimism about beating Zenit at Petersburg in the 2008 UEFA Cup final. Um, but I remember by the time we got to the Scottish Cup final that season, I just thought it'd be unfair in this Rangers team uh, to finish this season by losing a cup. We'd already won the League Cup, but to, to yeah, lose yeah. there, you know, and when Queen of the South come back to equalise from 2-0 down to make it 2 each, I just, I was like, this isn't fair. You know, and I hate that concept. Nothing, nothing in football is fair. But I thought, this, this team don't deserve this. And it was a relief that day that we, we, we pulled it out of the bag, you know, we, we got the win on that game. But I think on Saturday there, it was more like a celebration. And the way the, the team did it, again, it was almost like, I saw it, let's not, because we were pounding hearts towards the end of that game. But it's like, yeah. let's not bother, let's not bother getting the goal just now, let's hang on a minute or two. Yeah. Until it goes, not until it goes into extra time, just to show that we can do this again. Absolutely. It'll be stronger this. and stronger as the game goes on. My nerves were through the floor, man. I, I, it, was, it was horrendous. Well, talk to me about those nerves then, because with the season that we've had, um, I agree with you. That the, the thing that I kept saying to, to, to my family around me at, that, uh, at the game was, the players deserve to win something this season. They deserve it. But as you say, football is not about what you deserve. It's about what you go and win. Yeah. Um, we dominated possession from, from I'd say, from 15 to 20 minutes into the game. We, we dominated. We created all the chances and, and hearts. Hearts were tired. Hearts were blowing. I thought that certain hearts players were out of shape. Um, yeah. and, and that, to me, is unforgivable. But maybe that's Scottish football. But given that we failed to win a major cup for 11 years and that we have not had a good record at Hamden over the last decade or so, um, did you feel as we as we ticked over the 90th minute or even as that corner was given to Hearts on the 89th yes. minute, the same corner that Hibbs scored their winner in yes. 2016, did you fear the worst at those moments? That was sick. That, that was, was awful, sick, wasn't, wasn't it? it? <laughs> and I think that, that's what happened. That's one of those moments where you think, this is the comeback. This is us, we are back now. Yeah. And just John McLaughlin, he'll never know. I don't care how much he knows about Rangers history. He will never know how amazing it was. Just, he picked, he practically walked out and just picked that yeah, ball. Yeah, he just plucked it you from know, the sky. And he's no idea that I was in the middle of having the biggest nervous breakdown anybody's ever seen. It was, it was folk around me just going, I can't do this again. I'm like, I yeah. can't do this again. Yeah. You've got to be kidding. You've got to be joking. And it, it was just, it was reduced to nothing. And I think that was one of the, the great indicators. That and Scott Wright's magnificent tackle on that Bampot Haring. Yeah. Um, t- t- towards the end of the, the, the extra time when the game's won. That was just a magnificent, uh, that phrase I've been using so much this season, catharsis. Yeah. That, that, that word catharsis. It was just a great moment where it's like, it's all okay now. We're back. 
don't worry about it. There's, Absolutely. There's, there's no Ian Black getting kicked about the park by idiots. You know, yeah. it's uh, this this is this is a proper Rangers team and it's all going to be okay. And um to then <laughs> the goals we scored were just so beautiful. They were so well, beautiful. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think for to be Scott Wright as well, who got the winner. I mean, Ryan Jack, you think about that 2019. A League Cup final. You're talking about that corner, which just took us right back to to 2016. You you know, uh, and then you get Scott Wright, who you know has maybe been you know, the, perhaps the best sign the last couple of months of what Gio or any Brown Broncos can do. Why we should back him? Why we should let him? You know, make these mad substitutions or no substitutions that we don't understand. You know, the man is on it. He's got it. He came in the day after we lost at Hamden in the League Cup semi final. You know, um, if we thought. Can't call and I did a wee post match pod and just thought we can't take any more of this. Mm-hmm. We can't take any more of these Hamden, these Hamden doings. And he's laid on two of the most epic, memorable, uh, entertaining <laughs> Hamden moments to kind of cleanse the soul again. Yeah. You know, um, and both of them, I mean, we went behind against Celtic, you know, hearts a good chance early on in the game on Saturday, but we were just magnificent in both games, you know. And it yeah. makes you wonder what we'll do uh, next season once once uh, Arnold's got a, a pre-season into them. You know? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. No, sorry, sorry, more caffeine. Once more caffeine, that, more that caffeine secret, and, secret and coffee into them. No. Church water. Um, I, look, I think that the substitutions have been a, a really interesting talking point. Um, in my opinion, there are a lot of folk around me screaming from about half an hour into the game, get Kamar Roof on. Um, I think the fact that he didn't come on at all shows that he was not fit. Yeah. Um, he was not he was not able to contribute to that game. Um, su- surprised that Sakala didn't come on earlier, perhaps, and that we stuck with the, the the false nine. Which, let's be fair, it's a blunt attack. It's a very very blunt attack. Um, but in my opinion, Scott Wright and Glenn Kamara, in particular, changed that game. Those two substitutions, I felt, changed the game. I also felt, uh, as a little side note, that. The heart substitution of taking Liam Boyce off and putting Andy Halliday on also changed the game. They changed their shape. And if I was a Hearts fan, I would be furious at the way that Robbie Nielsen handled that game. Um, I I thought uh, it was defeatist, it was negative, and it was just completely inappropriate. But the Rangers side, the Rangers substitution to me really, really changed the game. I thought Scott Wright was superb, um, really, really joyful to watch. Um, Now, of course, benefit of hindsight, we can say Gio's made some stunning substitutions, changed the game, gone on and got, got the win. But had the goals not come and say we'd lost that game, there are going to be real calls for Gio to explain how it is that we were not putting an out-and-out striker on that park. Do you think that Gio has got to the point now where he, he does make some wacky decisions? He really tinkers with the squad during the game. It's one of the things I actually really like about him as a manager. It, it demonstrates his intelligence. But are we at the point now where Gio needs to be trusted with the decisions that he makes? Has he earned that respect from the Rangers fans who should be able to sort of take a step back and say, look, we trust that Gio's going to make the right decision here? And that's what that's what I mean to say about the about the, the goal scorers. They, they they just compound. It's, it's, it's almost like a Gio's own personal trophy he was lifting yeah, there by saying absolutely. you will never ever distrust my subs or non-subs that night at Perth we didn't bring anybody on yeah. uh, you'll never distrust me again we were talking about this last week mate and uh, the guys were on the um, the live chat which I, I can never work at the same time as you that's fine <laughs> you, you, you're the host you know um, the host with the most but uh, I we are saying Gio it comes across as boring sometimes boring as a press conference but it's because yeah. he's, he's just giving the dead eyes he gives nothing away you know, I like he, he'll announce things like Alfredo Morelos isn't playing for the rest of the season, as if he's announcing, you know, uh, we've got a warm up session this morning. It, it, it just is is at a level the whole time, um, but there is a kind of a, a surety with yeah. what he's doing, a focus that is absolutely frightening. I think you know, which you will require, you know, to get past all the howling at the rate. I mean, we've seen we've seen it melting the heads of people like Mark Warburton and Graham Murphy and what have you. That, that, that just that you cannot do anything right. You need to have a, a special focus uh, to have the rain, to, to, to take the reins at Rangers, um, and Gio's got that clearly in abundance. Um, I think the fact I'm saying this is a game we just lack a striker. The only thing we lacked, obviously, was a goal on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other thing that Gio has done is proved that if you give him three or four games with a player, and that's probably why we haven't won the league because we've run out of games. Yeah. He's come in too late. Yeah. Um, and and every injury that every setback that we've had, it's taken maybe two three games. But then the person he picks 
I keep going back to Scott Wright. Scoring those two goals against Motherwell. Yeah. He's cr- first leg against uh, Leipzig. Folk are wanting him hung, drawn and quartered. Second leg against Leipzig. He's part of the reason we got to that final. He's tearing them apart. Absolutely. Um, and he came on that, what he did when he came on that park the other day was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. But was I calling for that particular substitute? <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't actually know. But Joe Aribo is a case in point. Joe is... is most intelligent player, probably maybe one of the most intelligent players we've got. You know, he's super skillful. He's absolutely fantastic. And what he's played so many games this season, he's run himself into the ground. He's leading the line. He's not a striker, but he's leading the line in Seville. And he wasn't far away. You know, he couldn't make the kind of maybe run. That was part of the Tal's problem because, you know, Adibo's not coming short the way a natural striker would do. It's not his muscle memory to do this kind of stuff, but he knows come, come Saturday, we're lamenting the fact that he's missed a few chances. Yeah. Craig Gordon's a, a world-class save from as well uh, towards the end. I think if we had a game tomorrow night, and thank God we don't because we're, we're all physically done, but if we had a game tomorrow night, Joe Adibo's getting a hat-trick yeah. because he's just he's been he's had the two, three games up front in a row. That 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 will do. But in lieu of that, but just we'll just make that's what we've been doing. We've been making do and mend. Uh, and it's got us to a European final. So for Ryan Jack to come on. And just it couldn't happen to a lovely guy, a guy who's been there through it all, um, taking some abuse uh, from 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 uh, opposition fans. And that, that goal, you'll not see a better hit than that. And you know that, that, that's that's the best strike I've seen into that net since uh, since David Cooper um, that that free kick against Aberdeen back. It's absolutely sublime. You're you're you know? putting that goal above James Tavernier against Peterhead in the Petrofac final. I think you've got to take the opposition into and in, in, into yeah. into context and and the occasion. That was a lovely strike. That was beautiful to watch. But I think you've got to to, to see the opposition and also who's in goals. We've got Craig Gordon who. You know, um, much as we don't like the guy for his choice of clubs, um, as 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 a world class goalie at times, um, I, but I am putting it above Zidane. I was at that game as well, uh, the, right, the Champions yeah. League thing in two thousand and two. It was uh, it was just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it, was, I, it, was, it was a beautiful moment. If I was to ask you who was in goal for Peter Head that day, oh, the one and only. No, idea. <laughs> no, no, no idea. Hands your was... butt. No. That was very, very unfair of me. Um, listen, there's there's so much more we could talk about. We've not spoken about Willie Collum. Um, we've not even mentioned Calvin Bassey, who, by the way, um, oh, oh, yeah. has a shrine. Like, what a guy. Oh. It's just, I've, I've never seen anything quite like it. The, the way that he has endeared himself to the Rangers fans, probably particularly these last six months, um, from where he was 12, 18 months ago, going to a COVID breach sort of event, looking like he was going to get bombed out of the club to, to where he is today. Um, I've had friends down here in, in England who watched our final, uh, Europa League final, texting me saying, this guy is is something special. I mean, something really, really special. Talking of special guys. Special guys. Colin Armstrong. Colin, um, you weren't invited, but you're here. <clears throat> I wasn't invited to draw someone to ask why I wasn't invited, if I'm being honest. <laughs> well, Colin, it's a delight to see you. How are you? Oh, I'm very well. Uh, I'm on to wish you all the best, Ross, uh, because uh, as, as most people don't know, uh, this is your, your last episode uh, presenting and being a host of the Jersnet podcast. It is. It is. Yes. It's caught me off guard. I still had to This is your life. You know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, 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 I just wanted to come on and say, you know, you, uh, it was me and you to start with. Uh, yeah. We were the two original hosts. And it feels like a bit of a moment that you're leaving. And I'm genuinely sad to see you go. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, doing the show with you over all these years. You know, we took it from nothing, really. I mean, a couple of hundred viewers and hits. I think Frankie was ready for binning it at one point. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we've dragged it up to something I think that's fairly credible now and, you know, we've expanded it, we've went live, we've got sort of pre-match, post-match, all that stuff. Uh, and you were very much part of that journey and also you're good for a free meal. You know, you're good at... <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're good at putting your hand in your pocket and buying dinner, so I'll miss all that as well. That's but no, true. honestly, I will. I'll, I'll, I'll genuinely miss you, Ross. It's been an absolute joy. Oh, stop. Um Liz. Ross, I'm just going. I'm going to echo that. I'm just a newbie compared to you guys. I only come in for the. I come in for 55 and then get into European final. I'm just a big time, you know, supporter. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure uh, working with you, Ross. Uh, you're different class. One of the cheekiest guys I've ever met in my life. But you're funny with it, and that's the main thing, you know. And um, the it's been absolutely brilliant doing these European previews with you. Um, and I think the thing that comes through, apart from your obvious intelligence and your 
your class as a host. I'm not going to say who's the best. I'm not getting to that. You know, <laughs> I've been stuck in that before. Um, is that you're a total blue nose, mate? Uh, that's there's just you can always tell a guy who really feels it and uh, and loves this club as much as as much as we do. And I think that comes across. I think all the viewers will agree with that as well. And uh, ah, you're going to be. We'll have you back on. Obviously, I hope as as a guest every now and then, mate. And uh, Colin, I will definitely dig you up for a pint every now and then. But going to miss you like the hell, buddy. Oh, I'm and, sure. Uh, all the very best. No, it's it's. it's uh... That's very, very kind of both of you. I really was not expecting, I was sort of thinking I would quietly slink off into the sunset. But um, look, it's been it's been four years. It's been a, a really, really enjoyable four years. Um, I remember Frankie put a tweet out about four and a half years ago saying, looking at exploring, maybe doing a podcast. And um, to be honest, the reason I got involved in this is because I don't live in Glasgow and I don't get to talk about Rangers every day. So I don't get to go into my work and speak about Rangers with with my colleagues and my friends. So um, it was an outlet, and and it's it has as Colin says, it's really it's grown um, and could still grow, and and there's so so much potential in in this kind of thing, and and we've got a really I think a really good group of core contributors to this show. But from from those early days, um, we didn't really know what we were doing. We didn't really know how to frame the show. Do you remember Colin doing several yeah. of the week? Right yeah. back in the earliest days, yeah, um, it was it was pretty grim. It was pretty poor, <laughs> wasn't it? Um, and you that know, was your idea though, wasn't it? That was my idea. It was a shocking <laughs> idea, absolutely appalling. Um, and we've got yeah, cameras on and live shows and pre-match, post-match previews, all the rest of it. Um, yeah, a huge amount, and uh, it's, it's it's been a real a real joy. So thanks, thanks, Colin, thanks, Alec, thanks all of the guests that we've had on um, David Wren, who who'd obviously put a huge shift in as well as a host. Um, but, but also to, to Frankie for giving me a platform to, to speak about Rangers. And I hope I never said anything too controversial. I was, there was one, one or two shows that I did where I was completely battered. Um, the, the 55 winning show of last season, I was, I was away. Um, but it was a lot of fun. And uh, look, the only reason that I'm going is because I, I, I work for a football club now, which means that I'm, I'm working weekends, I'm working match days, I'm not going to see enough of the games. I don't think it's fair to to come on and try and talk about games that I've not seen. Um, but I'll, I, look, if you'll have me back as a guest at some point, I'll, I'll absolutely be here. So a massive thanks to everyone. Really, really, really enjoyed it. Really did. No, yeah, well, good luck, mate. Thank you very much. Look, I'll wrap up the show, I suppose. Um, guys, it's been it's been a real pleasure not just tonight, not just this season. Absolutely love that sign. Um, it's been a real, a real delight for, for four years. I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you to everyone for, for all of your support, all of your kind messages. Have to shout out David Christie as well, by the way, who tweets us after every single show. Um, that's a real joy to read that every time. I, uh, I, I have to thank David Christie as well before we wrap up, Ross, because I put out a thing today. I'm, I'm doing, me and a few mates are doing a sponsored block up the Myatt uh, for my mate Scott who's been loving with cancer for the best part of 20 years and he, he got some good news recently uh, we've been trying to get him up a hole for ages but because of his health he, he didn't want to do it uh, so he, he, he got some good news a few weeks ago there so he, he felt fit enough to go up the hill so I, I started a Just Giving page today and David Christie <laughs> was one of the first names to, 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 to put his, 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 his money in there so a big thanks to David for that as well uh, some man some man. Listen, it's it's quarter to 11. We have rabbited on long enough. A really, really special show tonight. Um, I, I'd like to extend my thanks again to Giuseppe De Luca from The City Talking for, for coming on and uh, and giving us all of that insight into the Rangers 72 story. It's, it's going to be a really remarkable piece of, um, of film. So please do go and get hold of that if you haven't already done so. Thanks to Alex. Thanks for calling for the surprise as well. A real pleasure. Um, for me this evening but but thanks as always to, to all of our listeners make sure you head over to the website at www.jersnet.co.uk like and subscribe the podcast wherever you get your podcast from uh, the show I'm sure will be back at some point in, in the coming days and weeks to do a little bit of a, a proper season review and wrap up um, but until then if I don't speak to you beforehand have a wonderful summer we'll see you next